the lighter. How long did she intend to go on? She must have known I wasn't here for her. She was doing a job, but she tried to keep it real during the whole thing. She was making the noises and the faces like what we were doing meant something to her, but I knew she was just a decoy. I had to make sure she wasn't on to me, so I played it up. I made noises when she made noises, and I made faces when she made faces. I knew she could tell something was wrong when I wouldn't make eye contact. My focus kept shifting from her neck to the room to the clock and back to her neck. The necklace. She took off the necklace. It was the only reason I brought her up to my room in the first place. She acted drunk down at the bar, but now that she was here on top of me, I couldn't smell any alcohol on her breath. The longer I let this happen, the farther ahead Tony got. He's probably on his way to, I thought when I looked at the time. I had already let this go on for far too long. Ten minutes at least. I reached over and grabbed my gun out of the nightstand. The dumb bitch was too busy making noises and rolling her eyes in fake ecstasy to notice. I was surprised I was able to keep it up for that long. It had to be some kind of world record. The world's most reliable penis. You won't find that in Guinness. I raised the gun and put it in her face. She was still making noises and bouncing up and down when she saw it for what it was. Her sounds were cut off as if someone had squeezed a balloon shut. Now her eyes weren't rolling. They were staring straight ahead and looking cross-eyed down the barrel of my gun. It probably would have been funny if I had seen this in a movie, but my mind wasn't in the mood for humor. Where did you put it? I asked, still pointing the gun at her. What? 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 She gasped, forcing her body to a stop. She was breathing heavily after her sexual pantomiming. The necklace, where is it? I asked. She didn't quite get the severity of the situation at hand, so I slapped her hard in the face. Her head rocked to the side, sending her hair in a wild gust. Where? I asked again, louder this time. I can't, I can't, she moaned, still trying to catch her breath. He'll kill me. Either he does or I do, I said, trying to sound indifferent. She took in a deep breath and looked around as if debating on who she'd rather have in her life. Had she known that the gun wasn't loaded, the outcome may have been different. Another three seconds of silence passed and then I cocked the gun in her face. Okay, okay, she said. Her eyes had gone from panic and terror to a more calm and rational look. She took another deep breath and said, In the bathroom, under the sink. I pushed her off me and shoved her back onto the bed. I held the gun on her for a second. She looked like a trapped rat. Don't move. If you do, I'll kill you, I said as I slipped into the bathroom. When I bent down before the sink, I could see that she had hooked the necklace onto the pipes just out of sight. I didn't bother with the clasp. I just ripped it off. The chain broke easily, but it wasn't the chain I was after. I rushed back to the bed where the girl was still laying. She had covered up with a sheet and was looking lost and afraid. Does this thing have enough charge? I asked, once again pointing the gun at her. She nodded. I walked towards the balcony door and with the pendant of the necklace clutched in my sweaty hand, an oblong diamond-shaped thing which looked like it was made out of brushed aluminum, I pressed the blue crystal button in the center of it. It gave a short, haptic vibration and then started to glow. A few seconds passed and nothing happened. I looked back at the girl. She must have seen the anger in my face because she recoiled on the bed and pulled the sheet up to her nose. If this thing doesn't work, I swear to God I'll kill. I started to say when a loud pop and a vast brightness exploded behind me. I turned back to the balcony and just stood there staring in awe for a moment. Outside, hovering 26 feet in the air was a bright blue hole. It had what looked like blue smoke and electrical energy coming out of it. Even though the door to the balcony was closed, I could still hear it making a deep creaking and buzzing sound. After a moment, I snapped myself out of my hypnosis and rushed to pick up my clothes. Once I was dressed, I pulled all the money out of my wallet, which was about $2,000, and threw it on the bed. Get out of here, I said to the girl. Get as far away as you can. If I don't catch him, he'll come for you. Her eyes widened and her mouth dropped open a little bit in surprise. She grabbed the bills on the bed and started to collect her things. I left her to her own business. I had business of my own. When I opened the door to the balcony, the sound of the hole stabbed into my ears. I could see people down below pointing at it and talking. It was starting to draw a crowd. I needed to act fast. When the hole first appeared, it looked like it was 10 feet across. Now it had shrunk to nearly six feet across. When I turned to get a running start, 
I saw that the girl had left. Good. With the door to the balcony still open, I ran from the room, onto the balcony, over the rail, and into the hole. As I traveled to wherever this hole was taking me, my senses were overloaded. It was so bright that I had to close my eyes. I could still see the blinding light through my eyelids. I smelled burning meat and charcoal. It was almost too much and I thought I might throw up. My skin felt like it was on fire and yet I was cold. There was no gravity. I was being flung from one reality to another and the space between was clearly not meant for humans. I'm sure I was screaming the whole way, but all I could hear was the fabrics of space and time rubbing together as I passed between them. If the trip had been any longer, I'm sure I would have died. I was eventually spat into the cold darkness. My skin was no longer in pain and the smell of burning meat was gone. I was on the ground which felt damp. The floor, I thought. Gravity. I'd never been so happy to feel something as common as gravity. I guess you wouldn't really miss it until you didn't have it. As I felt around in the darkness, I realized that this space was somehow familiar. I did a quick assessment and realized that while I had managed to keep the pendant from the necklace on me, I had lost the gun in the hole. It wasn't loaded, so it wasn't of much use anyway, but I still felt naked without it. I could have used it as leverage as I did with the girl. The sense of familiarity grew stronger, and soon, an instinctual force inside me had taken over. I began feeling along the wall until I found a switch. I flipped it and the lights came on. I immediately knew where I was. I dropped to my knees from the emotional weight of what I was seeing. The hole between worlds had just taken me to the basement of the house I grew up in. The house that burned down when I was 14. As I looked around at the jars of canned goods and tucked away camping supplies, I was overcome with a euphoric nostalgia. All of these memories just burned up in a fire and now I'm here. It's like it never even happened. A shout came from upstairs. There were people here. I heard a woman scream. Mom, I thought. I quickly and quietly made my way up the stairs and pressed my ear up against the door. There was a man talking. I could hear my mother crying and my father pleading for something. I opened the door without making it squeak. I still remembered how to do that. I poked my head out and saw Tony. His back was turned to me. He had my parents on their knees in front of him. My parents from 25 years ago. I couldn't stop looking at them. It was like one of those dreams that's so real that you wake up thinking that the stuff that went on in your head actually happened in real life. It was like that, but different in one vital way. It was happening in real time. I shifted my focus back to Tony and saw that he was holding something in front of him, a hostage. I didn't have to guess who it was. It was me. I was five years old. I had probably just been playing outside in the pit. It was a section of field that was overrun with dead weeds that I had tunneled into. I made lots of chambers that were interconnected, but the biggest one was right in the middle. I had dug out the ground a little to make it deeper and had named it the pit. I played out there most summers. When fall would come around, they'd usually burn the weeds, destroying my architecture, but they always grew back the next year. When the weeds were tall and dry, I'd go back out and start over, making little improvements here and there and always making the pit a little deeper. My father had always kept a baseball bat next to the basement door to ward off intruders, but now it was out of his reach, but it wasn't out of my reach. I picked it up and walked towards Tony. I stepped on a loose floorboard and it made a sound which caused Tony to turn around and look at me. When he did, I connected the bat with his face. He fell to the floor, losing his grip on five-year-old me, who then ran to be next to his parents. Go to the pit! Now! I screamed at them. Mom and Dad looked like they had no idea what I was talking about. Five-year-old me, however, raised an eyebrow and cocked his head. Go! I shouted, and they all ran outside, making sure to give Tony a white berth. You, uh, followed me, Tony said, obviously in pain and holding the side of his face, which was now red and starting to turn purple. You didn't think that girl was going to stop me, did you? I asked, still holding the bat raised. She gave up the goods easy, I said, and if you think you're going to find her, you won't. I pulled the pendant out of my pocket and showed it to Tony. She's gone. I made sure to send her far away so you can't get to her. I wasn't aware of what this thing was fully capable of, and I hoped to God that he didn't know I was bluffing, for her sake. From his reaction, I would say that the bluff worked. Gah! He shouted with a pained expression on his face. She is of no consequence! 
I could tell that the news had upset him. She must have been more than just a horde of this creature, judging by the look in his eyes. Before I kill you, I just want to know why. Why did you come here? Why me? I asked. Being here in my house from so long ago and seeing the younger version of my parents and the even younger me, I was overcome with emotion. Why? I shouted. He just looked at me and smiled. He smiled at me. That cocky look was all I needed to slam the bat into his face again. I did it again and again and again. With each strike, he fell lower to the ground and soon he was a bloody mess laid out on the floor. I stood over him, just watching him bleed. He was struggling to breathe and spitting up blood when he started to laugh. The son of a bitch was laughing. After all this, he reached into his inside jacket pocket and pulled out a pendant that looked like the one I had taken from the girl. Only this one had a red crystal instead of a blue one. I kicked it out of his hand and it flew across the room and slid under the couch. I hunkered down over him and looked him in the eyes. He was fading fast. Anything I needed to know from him I had to get now or it would be too late. Why? I asked again. Y you were the only one who could s stop me, he said as he struggled to speak. His jaw looked like it was broken in at least two places. What do you mean? I asked, cocking my head a little. The next thing he said was clear as day. The lighter, he husked. That sparked some recognition in my mind. I ran over to the couch and pulled the pendant out from under it. I compared it to the one I had. It was identical except for the crystal. What were you trying to do? I shouted. No answer. I looked over at Tony and he was no longer breathing. His eyes were open and he was staring up at the ceiling, but he could no longer see. He was dead. I looked at the two pendants in my hand and thought, if these are connected to each other and can create a hole through time and space to reach one another, what would happen if I activated it when they're right next to each other? I pointed the one with the blue crystal at Tony's body and pressed the button. Just then, a hole opened up underneath him. Instead of pulling him through to somewhere, the hole and its blue smoke and electricity disintegrated the body, sending tendrils of Tony mist through the air. It covered just about everything in the house with a layer of dust. I put both pendants into my pockets separately so they wouldn't accidentally press each other. After seeing what happened to Tony, I decided that I didn't want it happening to me. I went outside. When I got to the edge of the field, I called out to my younger self and his parents. Hey, you guys can come out now, I shouted. Is he gone? I heard my younger self shout from the pit. Yeah, I said, looking at my clothes, which now had a fine sprinkling of Tony dust on them. He's gone. I could hear some chatter in the weeds, and after a moment, my younger father poked his head up. I waved to him. He looked down and reached to help up my younger mother out of the weeds. My younger self came crawling out of one of the tunnels. When they finally caught up with me, they were asking all sorts of questions. Who was that guy? Where did he come from? Where did he go? Who was I? Where did I come from? Etc. Etc. I couldn't tell them much because I didn't know much. I knew some things about Tony because he'd been stalking me for over a year. I'd known about him eight months after he started following me. You start to notice the same car, the same face, even the same voice over time, and I was able to do a little stalking of my own. What I was able to find out was that no one really knew anything about him. He wore black suits, which usually had some kind of red accent. He was bald and had a goatee. He was skinny and he liked to drink. That's really all I could find out about him. When they started asking about me, I got quiet. I told them that I was just a friend who was looking out for good people. I happened to be walking by when I heard some shouting, so I came inside, I said. Of course, they were too busy with Tony to know any different. My younger mother nodded while my younger father rubbed the side of his bearded cheek in perplexment. I was about to tell them that I had to go when I felt a tugging on my pants. It was my younger self. He was pulling me towards his room. My room. When I was inside, he shut the door behind us and put a finger to his lips and made a shushing sound. I looked at the door and then back to the boy. I didn't hear any fuss from his parents, so I mock-zipped my lips and threw away the imaginary key. He started pulling his bed away from the wall and suddenly I knew. I knew what Tony was talking about. The boy removed a loose baseboard from the wall which had been hiding behind his bed. He reached in and pulled out an old cough drop tin. He held it up and brought it towards me. It's my treasure! You can have it! 
he said. He was looking at me as a child may look at Superman. Are you sure? I asked. I had some memory of this cough drop tin, but I could only remember keeping coins in it. I was excited to see my coin collection again. When the house had burned down when I was 14, I had forgotten about the hiding spot for a whole two years. Whatever I had left in there when I was 12 was sacrificed, and yet here it is again. However, as he held the tin and moved it around in his hands, it didn't sound like coins at all. That's when I knew. That's when I remembered. The lighter, I said. My younger self stopped just in front of me with his eyes about to pop out of his head like I had just performed a magic trick. How did you know? He asked. I stuck my hand out for the tin. Let's see it, I said. He slowly handed it over. I was going to give it to my dad, but I don't think it works. I kept pushing the button, but it doesn't do anything. It must be broken, he said. I opened the tin and inside was a familiar looking pendant. The crystal on this one was green. Just to make sure, I brought out the other two and examined them. On the underside of the green one was a small stamp near the bottom that read one of four. I flipped over the red one that Tony had and stamped on it was two of four. The blue one, of course, was stamped three of four. You have more? The younger me shouted. Do they work? Let me see. I'm not sure if they do or not, I said, studying the three objects. Thank you for this, I said, grabbing my young self by the shoulder. It felt really wrong doing that, I must say. When we walked back out to the living room, my younger parents were looking all over the house at the Tony dust. I looked around with them. Make sure you guys dust and vacuum, I said as I headed for the door. Wait, my younger mother said. We don't even know your name. I stopped and turned to face them. My younger self was now standing with his parents, staring at me and trying to figure me out. I can't give you my name, I said. But you don't have to worry about that guy coming back. He won't. They looked relieved at this, my younger self most of all. Just make sure you take good care of that boy you got there, I said as I dropped my younger self a wink. He winked back. I said my farewells and headed outside. I stood on the side of the road by my old house for a while, just staring at the three pendants in my hands. I listened to the sounds that only my five-year-old self would have heard that day. The birds, the wind through the trees, and the cows a couple of fields away. I took in a deep breath and the smell of home pulled tears out of my eyes. I let them fall for a moment or two while I came to my decision. I wiped the tears from my eyes and looked back down at the pendants or whatever they were. I pressed the one marked one of four. I was expecting something big to happen and braced for it. I waited with my eyes shut for ten seconds. After nothing happened, I pressed the one marked two of four. Again, nothing happened. I held the one marked three of four and considered what was going to happen. Either something happens and another hole appears taking me away from this past, or nothing happens and I'm stuck here forever. The thought crossed my mind that homeless people could all be time travelers that got stuck in the wrong timeline with a successful version of themselves. It made me think about which one of us, me or my younger self, would become homeless. I pressed the button on impulse. And suddenly, a ten-foot-wide green hole with green smoke and electricity appeared before me. This was it. Wherever this hole opened up on was where I was supposed to go. I had no idea where it would lead, but I had a strong hunch that I'd find four of four there. I turned around and looked at home from 25 years ago one last time. I'm still not sure why I did this, but I knelt down and dug a small hole in the dirt and buried the cough drop tin. Once it was covered, I stepped on it pushing it farther into the ground. I took in one more breath of home air and stepped into the green hole with it still in my lungs. I held it the whole way until I ended up here, I said. That was two months ago, and as you can see, going through the hole has taken my hair, I said as I wiped my hand across my new baldness. The girl at the bar just looked at me like I was crazy. She wasn't wearing a necklace. I could tell that she was uncomfortable, and I decided that I would just leave her alone and go wallow in my own tail somewhere else when she looked over my shoulder towards the door. Someone she recognized had just walked in. Now she looked anxious. I reached into my jacket pocket and pulled out a photo. In it was a man in a black suit with red accents. He had a bald head and a goatee. The girl's eyes flashed with recognition. 
She kept shifting her eyes from the picture to me, to the person who had just walked in and back to me. The person who had just walked in was a waiter and he was coming to take some drink orders. He passed us and went on his way. Now the girl was just looking at the photo. I saw that look in her eye. It was the look that said, I'm not supposed to say anything. I put the picture back in my jacket and leaned toward her on the bar. I gave her a little smirk and said, tell me about Tony. <laughs>